Welcome to this special, but not so special looking episode of 20 Minute Tims. <laughs> we are in international break. So we oh, have another reached, one. I know, another one. So we've reached towards our patrons and asked them to send us serious questions for real. So this is a special, the second special Patreon mailbag episode that we have produced this season. If you want to get involved in the Patreon and get lots of extra videos, extra writing, extra content, you want to contribute to podcasts like this, and others, patreon.com slash 20 Minute Tims is where you can support us, you can help us grow the podcast, keep us in new equipment, bring out new and interesting features, and just keep the old wheels turning an old TMT bus. Um, but on that, Stephen, how are you getting on? Melly, how are we? Good, it's, it's quite unnerving this format, I've noticed as well, because usual, normal viewers, regular viewers will notice that we've got a three camera setup, so it's all very sophisticated, mm. it all gets edited together and posed. So you can get away with a lot because you know when you're not talking, the camera isn't on you. So you can pick your nose, scratch your chin, <laughs> the lot. Yeah. I've noticed that we're all on camera, so you need to be extra careful what you're getting up to when you everyone need, else is talking. You just need to practice, Melee. What I practice is just the nod. Just periodically just go. <laughs> Even if you don't agree or you're not listening, just periodically go. Uh, we can't we can't do the usual things we do to put each other off when, when they're talking <laughs> as well. We just, yeah. we just simply can't get away with that. And Melee, yeah. we don't we don't see a Stephen in his completely, honestly inappropriate uh, <laughs> trousers that he sometimes wears. Oh. To the, he wears the tight grey joggies in front of the homies when he's recording the podcast, and it's yeah. it's it's not allowed, is it? Every Steamy week atmosphere. a different stain on it as well. <laughs> oh, what is it this week? <laughs> Absolutely true. Stephen comes into the podcast with a pair of joggies. Right. <laughs> he's like, I've got. Aioli on this, <laughs> toothpaste, mustard, it's, uh, condiments galore. And yeah, they're always they're always off white as well. They're always a strange off white color. Yeah, but yeah. Absolutely grotesque. Yet another international break, guys. Just when things are getting interesting, yet again they always come around. Just when things are starting to heat mm. up a little bit, there's a little bit of momentum starting to build. The the old title race is starting to hot up. There's games getting called off left and right, and then the tension just gets punctured by yet another international break. So here we are. I know I don't want to say too much about the national break because I know we do have questions here. So we put up a post on Patreon inviting serious questions for real. Uh, and we've handpicked with about 10 or so that we think we can get through in a sort of entertaining, knowledgeable, fact-based way in under about an hour. And that's how we judge these things. So first up, I thought I'd hit with a heavy hitter first. Oh. If we end up trophyless this season, does Broge get the bullet? Ask Kieran Tate. Oh. Melly. Yeah, he's got to go. I think the. Well, it's difficult with this because. A treble winning manager, now he's a dick. He's got <laughs> to go. I think it's. <laughs> if we get to the end of this season and Celtic finish trophyless, it's not all going to be Brendan Rodgers' fault. But at the same time, I don't think it's something you can come back from. Especially with the, the history he's got. When he came back at the start of this season, there was a lot of people unhappy about it. If he was to finish the season trophyless and attempt to go into next season and we go into Champions League qualifiers and we don't qualify, then we have a couple of def a couple of drop points at the start of the season. It'd just be like the Michael Beale situation for Rangers this season and we need to get a new manager somewhere down the line. I think it's difficult to come back through from nigh on impossible for Brendan Rodgers. But at the same time, if he does end up trophyless, I can't pin all the blame on him. There needs to be more change than just him. Stephen, much to disagree with Melly on that? Uh, well, I'm so torn on this. I, I, I honestly go up and down, much the same as Celtic's form this season. I find myself just on this constant roller coaster trying to decide. And yeah, you're right. I think ultimately it will boil down to whether or not we win the league because we'll feel completely differently about it if that, that happens. That's just the nature of being a football fan. At times this season, at times very recently, and we've had discussions in the Discord on an almost fortnightly basis, depending on where Celtic seem to be pointed at, at any given time. If they manage to string a couple of wins together, everything feels fine. But then as soon as the points are dropped, it's like, are we really, what direction are we going? Like, Is there any point in, in trying to push forward with this? At times in the last few weeks, I have been, I've been leaning towards, even if Celtic win the league this year, do I want to just roll the dice and try and come up with something a wee bit more exciting? Has this just staled? Has this just not quite worked out the way? And I'm talking about all angles here. I'm talking a little bit from Brendan Rodgers' point of view as well. I'm not just looking at him saying, nah, you've not got it anymore. It might just be that it hasn't worked. And as Melly said, it's not 
it's not entirely to do with Brendan Rodgers if this season fails. It's There's a lot of things, and we've spoken about it all season, about how many failings above and below Brendan Rodgers there are. Mm. But specifically about Brendan Rodgers, if we end this trophyless, that heavily implies for me that Rangers have won a treble. Mm. That's going to be the problem, isn't it? a very uncomfortable situation for us to be in. For them to have sacked a manager <laughs> after a couple of months and then to, to win a treble when everything should have been in place for Celtic is going to be a very uncomfortable situation for everyone at the club, including the fans, to, to be in. So I don't know if he can possibly survive that. The trouble is, I don't see Celtic sacking him and I don't really see him walking away either because mm. I think this job is one that suits him. I think. I mean, I'm not saying that that's like there's anything wrong with that. I think in terms of life... Every manager's in a job that suits them to a greater or lesser degree. Yeah, I think in, just in terms of lifestyle and in terms of what he wants to achieve... It is a club he has an affinity for. Again, that's the running joke about Brendan Rodgers pretending mm. to be a Celtic fan. I don't think that's true. I think it might just been a little bit exaggerated at the time. But I think this is a club that suits him. I think his family enjoy being in Scotland. So I don't see him walking away just because he's a little bit fed up and don't win trophies. I just don't see Celtic pulling the trigger on Brendan Rodgers either. I just Celtic so, are absolutely terrible at so making the right two. decision. So we get, if he wait, if trophy this season we've got two yet two yeses he needs to go yep. one and two so by the sounds of it, gun in my head I would pro I would go yes but again as I said I'm I'm very up and down with this it'll it'll really just be about depending on how I feel if we are sitting there having to watch them winning a treble and I can probably predict exactly how I'll feel to be honest mm. if if, if I, I'm watching that if I do that, that oh no if I do that does it look like a bit of gun to your head it whoa, does whoa. yeah, yeah. <laughs> gun to gun to your head Stephen Brendan gets the bullet I like this uh, <laughs> Not oh, for hey. me, no, no, not no. for me. I don't, I don't, no? I don't think so. Nah, nah, not for me. I think um, I've seen enough this season, uh, both good and bad, to help me make my mind up. And I think, yeah, it'll be a sore one if Rangers win the league. It'll be an exceptionally sore one if they win the treble. But then you have to ask yourself: Are you sacking a manager out of spite? Right, Rangers won the treble. You, you simply must get sacked. Is that is that the way we want to go forward? And the reason I say that is because. Just take that game there, that St Johnston game. When Brendan Rodgers has got fit players and good fit players, we play good football and we look like a proper Celtic team. The minute those players are not available and then he has to substitute in the substandard players, it just completely falls apart. And I think asking Brendan Rodgers to take on what is a good Rangers team, right? That's just... They're just a, they're, there might not be a good team in European football. They might not be a good team as far as Celtic teams have been in the last couple of years. But they're in terms of the Scottish League and every domestic trophy, Rangers are by far and away a good team. To ask Rangers to take on, to ask Brendan to take that Rangers team on, woefully under equipped, woefully, woefully under equipped for the task at hand. I I, I just think it's it's a. Um, it's baby out with the bathwater stuff. And look, I'm not saying that means he automatically gets another run at it next season. Because if he ends up trophyless next season, things need to change. In the summer, we need to see better recruitment. And I don't mean go out and sign fantasy players that were no chance of ever signing. I don't mean we need to go out and spend 40, 50, 60 million on three players just because they're the only ones Brendan Rodgers can win with. But at least a return to the standard of player that we as fans are used to seeing. And see, to be honest, whether it's Brendan Rodgers or another manager, that needs to happen. Oh, but yeah. it, does, it, it needs to happen. It doesn't matter if Brendan Rodgers is in charge or John Kennedy or you, Fantasyland, Ange comes back, never going to happen, obviously. Or you get the next up-and-coming young manager or you get the, the Davy Moyes one last year. It doesn't matter what profile of manager you get. We need to get players into this team, into this club that are of a standard that we, the fans, deserve. And I think if you do that, Brendan Rodgers has shown that he can get them playing and he can get them winning. But I do I do accept the fact that, you know, come October, as Melly says, if things still don't look up, if things aren't great in October, November next year, and he, he kind of has got the players, but he's not playing them. And there's kind of like, right, there's questions over the performance and it doesn't look, I think there's, I think we need to maybe have a look at it and go, right, it's not worked. But I think it's very, very dangerous because you, 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 you need to see progress with Celtic. And admittedly, we've not seen an awful lot of progress this year. No. But I think, honestly, I think I just he's been woefully under-equipped. And we know it ourselves. As fans, we see it. We see these players on the pitch and you just think, the guy's not good enough. He's playing Burnaby and Ralston. I don't want to list off players because it's the most boring, irritating thing you can do in a podcast. But just take Burnaby, that one player. He, he has to play him. 
he has to rely on him in games. But the first chance he gets to ship him out, he does it. He's a, he's a wee <laughs> after the transfer window's closed. <laughs> You know Fail I mean? to sign got... a left back in January and give one away in March. It's absolutely <laughs> And when asked about it, he's like that. Well, skills he can play left back if needed. So that that tells you what Brendan Rodgers always thought about Alejandro Bernabe, and it tells you what he thinks of a lot of these players in his yeah. squad. We've got home comes in, bombed out. Kelly takes his place, and it's all over the park. So now nah, I, I just think I think it'd be very harsh to to judge Brendan Rodgers. And also part of me, Stephen, you're saying. Roll the dice, you never know what you're going to get. I, I, I appreciate that position, I do. But I don't trust the sport to make the right decision. <laughs> I, 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 I just don't. So uh, I'm like, right, Brendan Rodgers, there's enough there for me to accept the guy's a good manager with poor players. But uh, the more likely scenario, honestly, is the if you've been Brendan Rodgers, do you stick with those level of players and you get a worse manager in? And I, th I, and I think that's probably the possibly. more likely path Celtic would go down. It's entirely possible, but there are also some realities that we would have to be dealing with here as well. That you're paying a guy three million pound a year to lose a treble to Rangers. I mean, how how can any business justify that? I mean, effectively, most working managers at all could finish second to Rangers and lose both cups. I mean, who would do worse than that? It's it's, mm. a, it's very hard to picture anything worse than Celtic finishing trophyless and then I think Jamie you said finishing trophyless again next season I wouldn't get to that because if we no. if we go out of the cup if we go out of the league cup at the first time couple of times of asking next season you would have to go at that point so again yes. that, these are these are speculative these are you know I, I don't know any different I, I don't know who Celtic would be likely to a point I do appreciate the point that it's very unlikely that we would go out and get the next big up and coming manager although we tried Celtics, Eddie Howe. We did try to replace, get a good Celtics, manager and how. The Celtics' record recently is decent, though. As, I mean, as low mm -hmm. as I am to give the board credit, the, the the track record in trying to attract decent talent to the club is decent because it was a toss up between, you know, it was. I mean, it was full everything towards Eddie Howe for weeks, mm -hmm. and then it fell apart, and then we get Ange Postecoglou, who was a brilliant appointment. But even sort of below that. There's uh, your your man uh, just been appointed the sporting director at Liverpool. What's his name again? The old Richard Scotland Hughes. international Richard the old, Hughes, uh, yeah. football manager legend. He was yeah, brilliant. yeah. So he was he was almost in the door with Eddie Howe. That was apparently one of the stumbling blocks. Was mm. the backroom staff and all that. So it's good. It's, it's talented guys that Celtic are trying to get club. hold of. This is what yeah. I mean. It's because we're a big club. So I, look, I just think that uh, you know I'm, I'm, I've I've got Brendan's back on this one, and I think. I, I, I just, uh, you know, it might all blow up my face, but, and I know it sounds ridiculous, like, oh, you lose and Rangers win the treble and the manager keeps his job, but I think there are extenuating circumstances on that. And I don't think, I, I don't want to say I don't think Rangers will win the treble because honestly it's coming right down to the wire, isn't it? It's yeah. very, very, very yeah. close. Um, but I, I just think that if I say, yes, he gets to go again next season, it's not the entirety of next season. It's, you know, I don't know how guns work, but we're, we're doing this thing. Right, so he doesn't get the bullet right away, but we go, and we're ready Aye. to give him the bullet. Work the bullets hovering over him. Well, um, like in films, like in like Fast and the Furious and all that, guns click when you point them at things. So if yes. you hold a gun to someone, it, it automatically just clicks over and over again, regardless of whether or not it's fired. Maybe we that's should a, probably change work. this subject as well, because people might <laughs> yeah. take offence to repeatedly talking about giving <laughs> Brendan Rodgers the metaphorical bullet. Yeah. Hey, let's see what's up next, Marco. Who would you rather see starting at Ibrox, Kyogo or Ida? Stephen. This this question directed directly to uh, Connor Goldson via us yeah. then. <laughs> this who we're asking. <laughs> uh, it, it's Kyogo for me. A, a fairly easy one. I, I reckon it's definitely Kyogo to start with because as we record this, this is in the middle of the international break. And again, as, as I said up front, it's kind of unfortunate in that it's come along and undercut the building of momentum hopefully that, that Celtic have started on. Kyogo looks back to his absolutely brilliant best as of St Johnson. M numerous chances, numerous goals, m some marginally offside of course, hit the bar. Great movement is something you can look at and identify. It's something we've been complaining about this season and that Kyogo was playing a slightly withdrawn role and we were quite excited about that at the start of the season. Do you remember back in those old days when we were mm -hmm. all so young and innocent, we were talking about, oh, Kyogo's playing a little mm -hmm. bit withdrawn. He's, it's like Harry Kane. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is <laughs> ironic Kevin Ange has gone to Spurs and all that, right? So fast forward a couple of months, we're all you know, kind of moaning about the fact that Kyogo's not getting on the, the end of chances that are not being created for him. But it looks like it's starting to click. 
Ida, I don't want to dismiss out of hand. I think he's been excellent. I, well, I've no, been I a big to fan. I up about something, actually, on yeah. Ida, because, and I should have, uh, but the moment passed me by, it was on the flagship when you were talking about how Ida was Thought more or less. Yeah, 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 <laughs> because uh, I didn't want you to cry like Elon <laughs> Musk. <laughs> <laughs> when I found up, um, it was about Ida. You, you know, you says you know Ida's been more or less written off. Not by this guy. No, Not no, by no me. that's true. Yeah, uh, that's I did true. have I did have Ida's back because I thought I liked the look of him. But I agree with what you're saying. I think it needs to be Aquio is the better player. It's really that simple. And he's got yeah. the track record against Rangers. And Ida always is an option off the bench. But I just think. Kyogo in these Rangers games is always absolutely dripping with menace, and they are up. They're just terrified of the guy and. Connor Goldson can he seem to pick him up and he's scored some great goals against Rangers and also crucially absolutely crucially when your back's against the wall and you're only getting one or two chances he's your man well that's it just to round off Mac and a point before I pass it on to Melly to, to hear his controversial views on yeah. who he thinks should start right? That that's kind of what I think about it I think if you were to give as we said if you were to give Rangers defenders this question I think they pick either every single time because I know that the the opposite view to this will be that, no, you need to get a big physical guy in there just to rough them up, make it uncomfortable for them. We're going to be up against it. There's not going to be any Celtic fans there, so we're going into the, the Lions' den, even though there isn't going to be any Lions there, is they? <laughs> so we're going we're going into the Lions' den here. You need somebody who can sort of stand up against the defence, rough them up a little bit. Mm. But they would take that all day long instead yeah. of not being able to find Kyogo. we darts in behind and all that and picking up space that they didn't even realise was there. They would pick Ida every single time. And it's not because they think Ida is a bad player, and I certainly don't either. That's not my point. But they would rather get into a physical battle with a striker than a guy that they can't pick up because of his... I agree. His his instincts, his ability to find space. So I, I think it, for all those reasons, it's definitely Kyogo. But but either will, you know, fitness willing, he will play a part as well. Hopefully, uh, in a positive way. Martin Melly. Mm, I'd disagree with both of you and go for oh, get him in there. They'd never <laughs> expect it. Who uh, man? I think That's another it, example of a player that Brendan had to rely on at one point. That as uh, soon as he gets the option to replace him, he's just never seen again. Doesn't even get in squads half the time. Yeah. I think. For me, it would be Kyogo as well. And if I'm looking at it from a point of view of, right, Kyogo starts and Ida comes on, or does Ida start and Kyogo comes on? I want Kyogo starting and Ida to come on. I think that would be the better the better way to go for Celtic. I think Kyogo can sort of create something out of nothing uh, against Rangers. He's done that in the two games already this season. And look, if Celtic are back to creating chances for him, then I've not got any worries for him. But if we... After the Livingston game, if we slip back into this where we don't create anything for him, what can he do? He can't do it all himself. So I think it's uh, Kyogo for me. And you know what? I've got I've got high hopes for Ida coming on as well. I've got this wee premonition that he'll score at Ibrox. But of course, we don't need to worry about getting a penalty there. So there's no need to worry about MD <laughs> taking that. So that will be fine. Next up. After seeing Kuhn take absolute abuse for a barely handful of games, are we as a fan base too quick to judge players? Asks Michael McKinney. Um, yeah, we weren't too favourable on Kuhn, were we, when he first no. joined? And I think I, when I saw these questions and I was making up the graphics for them, I thought, I think Michael might be onto something. But, uh, and there's a big but with this one, Melly, I think the reason Kuhn got such harsh treatment was because we saw the delivery repeated over the season, the repeated delivery of substandard players who all fitted roughly the same profile, age, club that we're buying from and price as Nicholas Kuhn. So he slotted directly in to pretty much the, the what's this, what am I trying to say, the mould, the model that we were having. So there was no reason really to expect Nicholas Kuhn was going to be that great when he arrived at Celtic. And the scouting reports were okay. They were kind of lukewarm. Yeah. You looked at the guy's history and he sort of failed at one or two other bigger clubs. So there was nothing like, this guy's an absolute find. He's going to be class. Then he comes, he's unfit for, you know, medical reasons, but, he's un but he is unfit. Brendan then plays him in games because he has to. He doesn't show anything. And you're just like, this is just confirming all the biases I had b before the guy even arrived. Yeah, I kind of, well, for me personally, it was the other way about. I think with the scouting from Alex, from what I've seen of him, I thought, do you know what? This one makes sense. This is a guy that's going to come in and play on the right hand side, and he's what Brendan Rodgers is looking for by all accounts. And 
judging by the summer signings and this signing, Brendan Rodgers had a lot to say on the signing when Celtic signed him. There was quotes from Brendan Rodgers, but a lot of the previous guys, there was nothing. So I think this one was one that he thought, well, do you know what? This is the guy Brendan Rodgers wants. And he comes, scores on his debut, and you think, right, this is him. He's just going to settle in now after being there a couple of weeks. It was the cup game he missed, wasn't it? The... A Bucky Thistle game, so you thought that would be been ideal for him to come in, but comes off against Aberdeen, scores and you think, right mate, this is it now, start the games now and here's your chance, but for me it was the just lack of running from him and I get that he had his wisdom teeth out and I should know better, I've had four out and it took me weeks to recover, but that wasn't really told to us, we were just told dental problem, he wasn't training and then out he goes and then it comes out that he'd lost a stone in weight so that's fine but it was the lack of running and the lack of any endeavour from him that really put me off him, it wasn't the fact that he came in and he didn't look like he was going to be good or he was signed by so and so or whatever, the fact is I had high hopes for him, he scored in his debut, right on you go mate and then he just sort of let you down after that, the Kilmarnock goal was pretty unforgivable for me you have to run you have to track back it, it doesn't take a lot coming on as a sub as well so he didn't show anything and if we're going to slate Mikey Johnston for the same thing I think he has to take that but when he doesn't perform well that's when your side of it comes in doesn't it because you just mm. lump him in with the rest going where are we getting these players from because I don't think he got the Adam Eder treatment uh, it wasn't for me the signing of Adam Eder. it was how did we get to this guy and why are we bringing him in after him only finding out about the uh, interest on the Monday and we bring him in on the Wednesday or whatever it was. So it seemed like Kuhn was fought out, brought in, going straight into the team and it just didn't work out like that. But it didn't work out like that because of his performances rather than anything else. So I just want to correct a couple of bad habits that we have in the podcast and we often, and we're all guilty of it, we say uh, when, when Alex scouted or we... If you're wondering, what are they talking about? Who's Alex? The podcast is simply you three guys. Who is this Alex that you keep referring to? And where can I find these scouting reports? It's part of our Patreon coverage. Patreon.com. We do scouting podcasts for every player and Celtic's main European opponents and things like that. So Alex Barker is the Alex we keep referring to. Uh, Kuna side, Stephen. Um, generally, just generally speaking, sort of zooming out a wee bit and focusing on the question a bit better. Are we just too harsh on players or is there a requirement? Because sometimes I think generally as a, as a support, are players more likely to play well when they've got lots and lots of encouragement? And the reason I bring that up is because Alistair Johnson, remember when they, we won 1-0 in a game, was it St Mirren or something? We won 1-0 earlier in the season. And he goes, they're booing us and we've won 1-0. And, oh, yeah, and, 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 and there's been a lot of comments about from the manager about the players needing positive encouragement. And it's one thing, actually, that the Rangers manager has been banging on about relentlessly, but they do pander to their fans a lot more than we do. And sometimes I think if you were more focused on positive reinforcement from the stand, and I don't know how that sparks or where it comes from, are players likely to do better? Or is it the opposite? Is... Is it creating that challenging environment where you need to hit the ground running? These fans are unforgiving and that's the end of it. Is it that that makes players play well? Is this a new thing? Are, are we really talking about how it's, it's un, unusually or excessively difficult to come to Celtic and, and perform well because the fans are too negative? I don't, I don't really know. I think on the question itself and all, all these questions, I think like a lot of things to do with as a support yeah, as a fan base, are we too quick to judge things? As with a lot of these questions, the answer is probably it depends because I don't like when a player comes in. Context is key here. So when a player comes in in July, in pre season, and they get a couple of games at the start of the season, maybe don't look great, maybe look okay. There is rarely a rush to completely write them off. In fact, even it's the opposite. If you dare to say, I'm not convinced by X player that's come in July and they've played a few games, it's generally, give him a chance. It's generally, let him, he needs a run of games. That's what happens. It's the cliche and we talk about it all the time. But people people do say that. So it's not, again, we support this size. There's always going to be huge variance in, in level of opinion and complete opposites, in fact. But that, again, context is key. 
He came in in January through no fault of his own. He, he's not done a single thing wrong here. He did not ask to be signed in January. He came at the tail end of a January where this was a red hot atmosphere of talking about failure yeah. in this club, right? And he has been dropped into this again through no fault of his own after the endless, endless discussions about quality and improving the first 11 and no more projects. This guy comes in, this guy comes in, 24 years old, ready to go. And he doesn't hit the ground running. He has a, he has a couple of dodgy games and doesn't look good. I don't think that people were ready to write him off. Again, I can't speak for a lot of people. I can only really talk about what I consume and what is in my purview uh, when it comes to the, the fans here. I, I didn't see people writing him off. I just saw people having a general, in my opinion, eye roll at what's going on here because th this is not what we were promised. It was just very similar with Ida. Ida came in and people were happy to just go like that. Well, we've signed another a Norwich reserve. Norwich is third choice striker, right? And and basically, he he got the chance to prove himself. He played straight away, contributed straight away. Kuhn didn't and he was left kind of lingering in that sort of limbo of uh, yet another disastrous January transfer window. So it's all been very unfortunate for him. So I don't, in my view, I don't think people were ready to write him off. I think people were just frustrated with what the club have been playing at for the last couple of months and the trickling away of the lead at the top has led to that as well. But I think in general, it's the other way around. I think I think we cling on to hope that players are going to be good long after it's been proved that they're not. So I think in general, we're probably quite an optimistic support when aye, it comes to new just screaming ball and goalie. How many people <laughs> well, are telling us I... You don't yeah. see it. He's he's good. He's actually good. Well, that that's a, that's one. Of, that's an uh, an example that comes up quite a lot because after a couple of games or even one game, I thought to myself, and I think I said on a podcast, I don't think he looks good. But I'm not going to write the guy off at all. I'm not going to write the guy off fully. I just said after a game or so, doesn't look like a very good player, and it turned out he wasn't. But it was. It went on for at least a season where now I just needs. He's a better. He's better than Greg Taylor. He just needs a run of games. He needs to be played at left wing, etc. So, again, this, these aren't criticisms. Again, they look silly now because it proves that to not be the case at all. But what I'm saying is that I think in general people are very forgiving when it comes to, mm. to new signings and, and hang on to it for ages and ages. Even after they're gone, it's all, oh, look, see, proved wrong. Mikey Johnston, after eight years, he scores a couple of goals for West Brom. No spoilers. Wrong. No spoilers. Oh, yes, we've got a question, so don't even, don't even approach <laughs> okay. that subject because we've got a question later on about Mikey. Okay. So, I, I honestly think that the club did them no fa did themselves no favours. The way that the season kicked off was completely yeah. weird from the start to the, to the end, to the start to the middle to the end. It's been a very weird season. It's been like... I don't know. It's it's. It, it, I suppose it, what is there an analogy of? There's nothing really. It's like a new film's coming out, but you just hear, you know, that from the beginning it's plagued by production problems. It's like everyone kind of decides it's crap before they hear and all that. Yeah, then you hear the, yeah, hear the <laughs> yeah. casting and you go, he doesn't seem like a good fit. He uh, doesn't seem like a good. Then when eventually the the movie comes out, you've kind of already made your mind up that it's crap before you've even given it a chance. And I think yeah. that's kind of a lot of what happened to Celtic season, even right at the very beginning. The no sort of marquee signing. Now, I say that and I'm well aware that we could have a team here full of like really good players next season. All these guys, that could have been yeah. a really influential window for next season. But again, it's you never got by. Basically, what I'm trying to say is you never get buy in for the fans. So you've created yeah. a really difficult environment in which yeah. to operate. Next up, Brendan Gray. If we manage to win the league this season, where would it rank in terms of title wins? For me, it would be up there just behind the stopping of the 10 in 1998. Um, oh, with it, Brendan. Didn't even bother changing the first <laughs> name when he submitted this email. <laughs> Brendan Brogers, is it? Um, <laughs> so I think oh, Ange's first season was really dramatic for me. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a dramatic title win. Um Melly, your memory's much better football than mine, but what was the Gordon Strachan last gasp with a handful of games left of that 2007? Uh, the Tommy Burns seven, title. Eight. Yeah, yeah, 7 8. That, that one was unbelievable. Um, where does this rank? It, it's different because in both those seasons, I was filled with positive optimism that we were probably more likely than not to do it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas this season, I'm so annoyed <laughs> at the way it's played out that it's more like. You better fucking win this title, and you know I've got uh, uh, Ralph and oh please win the title, my God! Um, uh, look, I've got faith that 
I know it's it's so difficult, but I just <coughs> I just have faith that this team can dig it out. Do you know what I mean? I've just got everyone. It's even Celtic fans have written us off. I know they don't admit it, right? But they have. There is mm. no one talking about you know. There's no one. I've not heard one single pundit say something to the effect of Rangers need to be careful because they still have to play Celtic twice. I've not. I've not even heard no. that sentiment expressed, and. The, the, it's all one way traffic as far as Celtic are not performing very well which we're not it's true Rangers are flying but I have not heard one pundit one journalist anybody even the guy that comes on to Sports Sound and picks his favourite Neil Diamond record very odd <laughs> very odd inclusion it's that infuriating it really is so weird. driving home right in the middle of the analysis I'm driving mm. home and I'm having to listen to I don't know, Wonderwall by oh, right. some... <laughs> Morris Ross is picking some Wonderwall. We're about to go to Tyne Castle to hear this Brendan Rogers speak. But first of all, Morris Ross, do you want to give us a, a, one of your favourite songs? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going on, man? <laughs> um, so where was I? I threw myself off track. Uh, yeah, there's, there's no, been no sentiment about Rangers needing to be careful that Celtic are, Celtic are not done... You know, there's no sentiment along the lines of this is an experienced manager, a team that have been through it. They still have to play Rangers, Celtic twice. There's none of that. It's all one way traffic, and that that sort of seeps into Celtic fans as well. But I, I just think we have got a, a couple more performances in. There's some fight left in us yet, um, and I don't think we're just going to roll over and you know let Rangers take this title, Melly. No, I don't. I think sorry, it... I didn't answer the question. Sorry, sorry, just to quickly put a button on it. So where does it rank? Probably third behind those two, if I'm yeah. honest. Yeah, I think the, the Ange one a couple of seasons ago, his first season was so intense and it was completely different because Celtic had a terrible start. What They drop four, point, uh, four ga- points in four games in the first seven and you just felt, how are we going to do this? But that was building a brand new team and then once it got to January, we bought the... Brought, actually brought in good players then it seemed to work out for us and we, we got on that run Celtic just haven't had that this season we haven't had that run but at the same time don't think it'll be as sweet as that or the Tommy Burns one but this one will just be different because I think this is a really really poor Celtic team in fact looking at it will it be the poorest Celtic team that has won the league for me possibly up there That's maybe shout, Ronnie Dyla's second against the season. Rangers Maybe yeah, definitely, definitely against, against the Rangers. Yeah, yeah. against the Rangers. Uh, whichever kind of Rangers it is, but uh, <laughs> if we win this season, it will feel really sweet. But my attention will instantly turn to Celtic, and again, like you've said before, Jamie, Celtic never do that again because yeah, it's not acceptable that, that we're sitting Take watching this with so, mouth, yeah. <laughs> so much money in the bank. I will enjoy it. I will turn my fury to Celtic and say you need to sort this but what I will also do is a good opportunity to go how bad are you we are really poor and we still won the league but I think the biggest thing for me going into this despite what I said in the first question is it's not a player it's Brendan Rodgers Brendan Rodgers can get us over the line and I believe that because I don't think uh, and your side, Ange is a completely different kettle of fish, but any other manager Celtic have had recently, I wouldn't, I'd be very little confidence here that he could do it, but just with Brendan Rodgers, I know he knows how to navigate this, it doesn't mean to say he definitely will, but if Celtic get over the line, huge plaudits have to go for to that guy because I think this is a really poor team and he's cobbling this together and if we can get a couple of players back now, I think we'll be set to win the league and Look, it's not the games against Rangers that have worried us. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the run-in now. Asked me a couple of weeks ago, wouldn't have said that, but I think Celtic are starting to hit their straps. Strangely, I was less confident for the Rangers games than I am for the... So the, the two Rangers games that were pa- that have passed, I was less confident for than those, the ones that are coming up. But mainly, is it because we've got to here? Is it is it because right the, the we're, we're out probably, of time here? We're out of options? Well, okay, I, I, I've got a wee question for Melly just for a pass to you, Stephen, just based on what Melly said. Melly, you said Brendan Rodgers deserves huge plaudits if he manages to get this team over the line for this season and, and end up winning the league. On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you put that achievement? 10 being a, 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 the strongest achievement of any Celtic manager and 1 being a, a completely expected of you? Um, probably an 8, I think. An eight. Because I think, look, 
There is decent players there. I think McGregor, Carter Vickers, Kyogo, Matt O'Reilly, Hattati are good players. The rest are not very good. And so, look, there's so many players I would and could replace there. And mm. This is well with the injuries. Everything seems to have conspired against us. And the signings we've made have been so poor. I think it would be we've managed to win this league. It would be very difficult, man. Okay. So it's an 8 out of 10 if he achieves it. But sacked if he doesn't. That's, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's, that's the way yeah. it is. Well done. That was an amazing achievement. You claim this close to getting sacked. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's the fine margins. And it's not just sacked because I think he's a bad manager. I just think don't think it's conducive for a good atmosphere if we go into next season with a manager who has lost the league to Rangers, who's also got the baggage that Brendan Rodgers bought to the club and then we've got a summer of upheaval where people are wanting massive change and it's probably not going to come. So mm. the thing to change is the manager. So do the board just take all the fury and go, now nah, we'll stick with the manager, stick with what we're doing and see how it goes? Or do they think, see if we get a new manager, it takes away from us? And does Brendan Rodgers want to stick about with these players as well? I don't know. Well, uh, just so just to get back to the question, Stephen, where does it, where does it rank for you? Well, it's, yeah, the way I don't want to go too far back to the first question, of course, but it's like the Brendan Rodgers thing, like sticking and twisting. It's like, how would, so maybe the, a, a weird analogy, but if we're three years in, well, if we're going to have three years of Brendan Rodgers, which is the most you're ever really going to get out of any manager, and why Lunch would you want five. to go? Yeah, why, <laughs> nonsense. Why would you want to go past that? If we're one in, what we're really doing here is we've watched two series of a TV show that we didn't like but people are telling you it gets good when you get to season five. That's every two, TV show nowadays. Uh, series two has ended on a bit of a cliffhanger, but I, I was bored throughout. So, so people there. say that to me about Be Better Call Saul. Do you watch Better Call Saul? <laughs> I watched the first couple of episodes. It wasn't very good. Oh no, season 100 th episodes in. And right, season, three cooking. Is, uh, season three is the best telly. I don't have 200 hours to sink into <laughs> yeah. Better Call Saul. Can I not so, just watch season three? Nah. Right, so do I, do I stick with this? Do I stick with this? Take people's word for it that it's going to get better or do I stick the wire on again for about the eighth time knowing, <laughs> yes. I'm, going to, <laughs> knowing I'm going to bore people by <laughs> quoting it every two minutes? So the, the question itself, where does it rank? It's actually, it's really hard to do that while the season is still going on because seeing any of the season you would compare it to, you obviously have all the facts and mm -hmm. when it comes to you know, pulling off amazing comebacks and coming for like the, the stop in the 10 was amazing because everyone had written Celtic off like the Rangers still had Richard Goff and Gaza and Brian Loudrop and Marco Negri and all that. they had all these players and Celtic out in a point Vim Janssen what who's that who's this guy so it, it was completely written off and we somehow managed to do it but when you're when you're looking back at these seasons these quite boring draws and dropping points here and there they don't matter nobody ever no. remembers them no. and and because we're in this season it's all we can focus on because we've literally just sat through it so it's it's really hard to do that so all what i need to do is fast forward all the way to the end and imagine how it's going to feel to have pulled this off despite the fact celtic have been quite poor all season and it's going to be brilliant it's going to be brilliant if celtic managed to do that of course big if and all that because we're currently behind but that's great for drama be the biggest if it comes off ever. Yeah, be the biggest I told yep. you so ever. So it's it, receipts, receipts. All, all, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm knee deep in receipts just now. <laughs> so, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we can do it. But where does it rank? It's, it's again, it's very difficult. So what I need to do is project and think. Well, is this going to be as good as the 0708 season? Hard to say because that that's sort of sepia tinged and has that nostalgic buzz around it, whereas this season doesn't yet, of course. But it's going to be right up there. It's definitely going to be right up there, and it will be a case of. If we can get to the end of the season, hopefully win the league, just big sigh of relief, and then hopefully this daft, cl this bullshit club can move on and actually do something <laughs> positive for once, right? Again, it's, it's the thing you took the words right out of my mouth, Melly, and there, and you took the words right out of Jamie's mouth previously. Never ever do that again. Never put <laughs> us through this again. Let's do it properly next time. Needless. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> of never, speaking of never doing things again. Uh, Nat Phillips there on the graphic <laughs> you guys can see it at your end yes yes Mike 67 with a new head of recruitment inbound what are the thoughts on the recruitment strategy going into the summer will there be wholesale changes if we lost the league it's funny because the word recruitment strategy is 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 bandied around is it going to be a good one or is it going to be a bad yes, one that's, <laughs> the, all that, that's all it comes down to that's, <laughs> yeah. and it's not just Celtic I, I think a lot of people make up 
like their minds about recruitment strategies. They think that you know they think that there's some clubs out there with the most complex data led scientists and lab coats <laughs> trying to figure out the best players for you know well this guy's slightly stronger on his left foot that means when you play the ball and, and nah every manager is just out there trying to get the best footballers they can absolutely afford and they're using ways and means but there's not I don't think there's that many teams being hyper creative about their recruitment now it seems to all be agent led it seems to all be contact leg because maybe there was a period in time where there was a bit of a lag where if you were a club or a recruitment person at a club you could look into the data see where the key see where these excellent young players were that were busting out of the stats and gobble them up before anyone noticed but football's kind of caught up in that now I feel anyway and it feels like you know, like, say, for instance, you're talking about Brighton. They've already got a market where they get the, the, the up-and-coming players from, like, South America and, and populate the rest of the, yeah. the English Premier League with them. That's not data-driven anymore. That's connections, that's agents, that's contacts in the game. And, I, I you know, I, I, I'm happy to get proven wrong, but it seemed to me like that sort of calm boom of maybe five or six years ago when clubs were getting really obscure players from leagues and making a fortune on them. It seems like the football um, market has caught up on that and now and, and you've got little to no chance. And I think what Celtic did was they try to be quite creative in their signings this summer. They try to utilise contacts and maybe more obscure leagues and bring in some really good, what they thought were young players. And, you know, I will say that there is still time for a lot of these guys to turn good. You know, they're still, the majority of them are quite young in their football lives. But I think... The recruitment strategy next year needs to have much more input from the manager. If the manager says, you need to get me players who are, for talking sake, over six foot, who are strong, who are powerful runners, you don't shelf that and go and get what you think is the next best winger from Korea and the next best winger from the Norwegian league and then some Honduran left back. No, 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 that's fine. You can do that. But we need to be less focused on that thing and more focused on the players the manager actually wants and needs. And I think people think that's old-fashioned, letting a manager rule the recruitment, but he's got to work with the guys. He's got the vision for the team. And if he wants a player and the player doesn't break the bank, you need to get him. You need to do what we've done before. And all these successful Celtic teams, they've always had one or two players who we knew were too good for Celtic, kind of, yep. or went out and, and, and got those extremely good bits of quality. Even Brendan Rodgers' first time had Musa had Edward, we had Jota most recently. I tried to ban that word for the podcast. But you but you, but you know you know what I'm getting at. I think the manager needs to have more input. We need to spend more money, crucially, on players. And yes, you can buy players for tomorrow, but there must be more focus on players for today. That's what I think needs to change in the summer, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a word that, or maybe not a word, I'm maybe paraphrasing Brendan Rodgers, but after that window closed, then he, he, he's not a stupid man. He, he's not an, no. a, an ignorant, he's not an oblivious man. He knows that the fans weren't happy about it. And just after that, Jamie, you, we just so happened to get to the opportunity to send someone along to press conference, which you did, Jamie, and, and got to confront Brendan Rodgers. Mm -hmm. And he was actually very open about it. But during that time, he was talking about the club being too... Uh, again, I apologise if I'm braver. Is yes. What he said. Okay. So that that's exactly what, what I was getting at. So uh, I was about to par paraphrase and, and use words like, you know, caution. You know, a little bit too reserved when it comes to, to to these things. Again, he's not going to come out and outright name players that he would have wanted because that's a foolish and unfair thing to do to players, right? Yeah, he's not yeah. going to do that. But he did say that players wanted to come to this club and that the club were too cautious, lacked bravery. Uh, as you as you say, now those two things weren't said in the same sentence, but they were said. So I'm putting them together and thinking, right? Players were contacted. Players were there. They were available. Maybe not necessarily in terms of available, as in the selling club has said you can have this guy, but attainable. Mm -hmm. Again, this is all Brendan Rodgers either outright saying or heavily hinting at in the media, including you. So mm -hmm. the Brendan Peter Lowell then came out. Uh, shortly afterwards with a statement talking about how disappointed they were in not being able to get the targets over the line, you know, yada, yada, all Copy these paste. Familiar, <laughs> familiar old stuff, yeah, but, but my answer to that would be, yeah, 
selling clubs are not going to sell you their best players for your ridiculous derisory bids, right? <laughs> so if you're out there trying to get players for 2.5 million in January, correct, I agree. We are on the same page. You're not going to get clubs' best players when they are very reluctant to sell, which is why you have to pay, pay something approximating the market value for these players. <clears throat> See if a player is worth £800,000. I don't want them, right? I, I don't want mm. the guy. If, you, if you're humming and horn as to whether this guy is worth three, three point five. £6 million, did I even say that? If you're humming and hawing, don't sign him because he's not worth it, clearly. If you're out there trying to get bargains, then it's the fundamentally yeah. the wrong-headed way to go about it. Again, I don't want to be... I'm not saying be an absolutely cowboy about it and just start throwing about money for absolutely no reason, but if we all agree, if the recruitment team, if Brendan Rodgers, if Peter Law... Peter Law was the wrong example. He's not directly involved with transfers, and I don't want to imply that he's not because it's an unhelpful attitude out there that... People think Peter Law was standing in the way. But the club, I'm taking him as like a figurehead for the club. Michael Nicholson is a better example. If they all agree that this guy is the guy, right, but it's going to be 6.8 million, nah, sorry. That, that's not good enough. It's not good no. enough because we're going to pay for that one day. If you're not going to pay for it financially, you're going to pay for it in terms of the success of the club and you're going to pay for it in terms of trying to sell season tickets to people you've just completely let down at the, at the other end of it. Don't get me wrong, Celtic will always sell season tickets, but it might not be the same people that you sell them to. And, the, and those be people, angrier. And yeah, you'll be pissed yeah. off and you'll yeah. create a bad mood around the ground and around the stadium and you create ill will and it Correct. sort of feeds back to what we were talking about earlier on. It's So the, the recruitment strategy... You know, it doesn't need to torn up, but I just find it mind-boggling, Melly, that the manager's left wanting. Mm. Very presumptuous that we're going to bring in a head of recruitment. We'll probably just go out. Remember the whole talk before Ange was, we'll bring in a director of football and just didn't do it and it was fine. But I think that's why the summer was so infuriating and I don't want to harp back to it. But when Ange came in, he came in with a sort of blank canvas and he was allowed to go and sign players that he wanted and that fitted into his team and lo and behold he had a good team that did what he wanted to do but it was a good blend he brought in experienced guys like Starfelt, Kyogo, all these guys Juranovic, Jakimakis, all these guys that had played football and were first team ready they went in and they were good players and some of them have left now already and we've made profit on them. So I don't see the harm in bringing in these types of players, getting a good season, season and a half, two seasons out of them, and then moving them on for slight profit. Or do you know what? See if we get to keep them, we keep a good player. Yeah. I don't know why we had that balance in there under Ange where we're bringing those guys in alongside supplementing them with Matt O'Reilly and Jota, young guys coming in and spending money on Jota and Carter Vickers and then all of a sudden it's this rigid system where we need to stick yeah, to these guys that exactly. can't go above that. And the biggest kick it looks, see if you want to get guys at under 24 years old with international duty and all that, that's all fine. But see if you think you can get good players for under 15 grand a week. I don't know what market you think you're, you're yeah. in because it's simply not going to happen. I keep saying it, look at Rangers, all their money's on the pitch. They've got guys on high wages on the pitch making a difference for them. Celtic have got players littered across the squad that we've had to buy or loan out already or just get rid of and it's not conducive to a successful I, team. Ange just, had to come in and buy those players. I don't think that sort of restructure will happen again but that blend was there and the blend was he brought in players that came in and played and improved his team. Barely any of the signings this season have done that, so we need to figure out what it is we want to do. Are we wanting to be world class and everything? If we do, <laughs> we need to start laughable. spending money about it. We need to start doing things yeah, that man. other clubs are doing. And look, look at it right now with uh, down south. And I know it's a easy comparison to make, but Celtic should be a smaller version of these teams. Liverpool, Man United are going out their way to secure the best people they can get behind the scenes before the football on the pitch gets better. Celtic are the other way about getting a good manager and then hope everything will fall into place. It doesn't work like that. And the crucial thing about getting a good manager is you have to trust them and you need to back them with the players that he wants. Celtic are sort of trying to cut cut between two stools. Um, See the other part of that question, Jamie, before we move on, I noticed there was something about will there be wholesale changes uh, if we lose the league? Is that Mm. referring to staff or players or both really? I think it's it's basically the whole thing. Will it be an extinction level event? Uh, (sighs) Well, I, I, I just... 
I don't. I, I think there's going to be. A whole, I think there's going to be dramatic change. Regardless, what, what would you? What would you? Like. What would you consider dr- dramatic change? Because when Neil Lennon left, Neil Lennon left, and Peter Lawwell left as well. That was about it. We sold players who were in the last year of their contract. That was always going to happen, pretty much from that. But was there the big dramatic change that he expected? Because Celtic didn't really go down a different route at all when they brought in Ange and all that, did they? Well, they didn't they, bring well, a they, director of football, none of that happened. Well, they brought in Mark Lowell, didn't they? They brought in a director of football. You might not have liked him, you might not have appreciated his name, but they, they, they certainly even, brought in Even a... then, that's a head of recruitment. A director of mm. football is a different job. You need a head of recruitment and a director of football. Yeah. I mean, well, the problem is, you don't know what Ange, you know, you don't know the circumstances in which Ange joined the club. Ange could have came to Celtic. Ange knew he was a good manager. Like, I think we need to forget the idea that we somehow rescued Ange from deepest, darkest. He yeah. knew he was a good manager. He knew he was a successful manager. And knowing what we know of Ange just now, you can picture him in that boardroom going, OK, I'll come to Celtic. I'll give you two years but, uh, and I can rebuild this club and I can get you a treble in two years. But I'm not having any director of football. I'm going to come in with my agents. You're going to get me the players I need to do it. We can work to get, you know, you can envisage him being quite forceful in that way and Celtic being in a position where they kind of have to take it because it suits all parties. You know, this this notion that Ange came in and, oh, thanks so much for the opportunity, Celtic. I just don't see that anymore. I, yeah, I see the yeah. opposite. I see Ange coming in going, look, I'll give you two years. I'll get you back on track. I'll get you a treble within two years. We'll do something in the Champions League. Here's what I need from the club. We need to reinvest. You need to trust me. You need to get the players in I want. There's players in Japan that I want to bring over. You need to make that happen. If you can't make it happen, I'll make it happen. Because very quickly, that was the chat we were getting from Ange, wasn't it? We're too slow in signing players in here. Yeah. Next thing you yeah. know, Don McKay's out the door. So it's... Celtic did make changes, but I think there's an acceptance, or there needs to be an acceptance from the fans. And the, ergo, the, wait a second, I'm, I'm just not, not, not finished my sentence. Uh, there's a, there, needs, there needs to be an acceptance from the fans, and then pressure on the board that we're not going to do that again. We're not going to get in a manager, get substandard players, scratch by our fingernails to compete in Europe, compete in domestically, like and crawl over the line. That's no how Celtic operate. So I just think it's unacceptable to the fans and I just don't see how the board can go again next season with anything remotely close to what we've seen this year. The, the problem was Ange came in, Don Mackay came in, Don Mackay went out, Mark, Michael Nicholson get bumped up and then Peter Law ends up back with his son in charge. You're like, what's going on here? It wasn't, we expected a stink, extinction level event where Celtic tore it up, got themselves a modern club like Don Mackay said, and then we didn't see any of that. In fact, we saw, we went backwards. Well, There's another we're... possibility with with mm. Ange as well. Before we, we completely close off that, I, I know it's it's more conjecture for me, but there is a pos- another possibility with Ange and it possibly leading to Celtic being a little bit complacent with it, as they do. I mean, I, we've already acknowledged tonight that it's, it really is just a case of sticking a manager in and hoping that he basically papers over all the cracks. It, it, and it did happen with Ange. Yeah. But when it came comes to the, the director of football stuff, there was a lot made at the time about how Ange didn't really want that. But I, I don't think we can underestimate the fact that Ange just tends to not really care that much. He tends to just go into the clubs and talk them, isn't he? Yeah, but he, no, well, but, come on. But in in general, Ange just comes in and he has a, and as you say, Jimmy, is is a a lot of belief in what he can do. This is about him coming in and instilling his football and beliefs into a team and, and taking it from there. If you really ask him, do you desperately want a director of football? He's probably going to tell you he doesn't really care that much. He went in his Spurs and Harry Kane left within about three weeks of him taking the job. He was asked about it and he didn't really care. I mean, I'm sure he would have preferred that Harry Kane would have stayed. But in general, Ange is a guy who just sort of pushes forward and just decides, look, it's about the football here. It's about my football and these players. So I think Celtic have maybe, again, I could only speculate, but I've maybe taken advantage of that and just thought, right, we'll just let this guy go on with it then. We'll just, we'll just yeah, go, yeah. kind of stand it back and let Ange there. I'd agree with that. Uh, we're about halfway through the questions. So I think if we want to get, yeah, I think uh, we're about an hour round. into the podcast. Yeah, so I think if we want to get through them all, uh, we can sort of tighten our answers we up and make sure we get everyone's question answered. 2024 is here in full swing and that means it's time for New Year's resolution check-in with our friends at Manscaped. Newsflash, it is never too late to up your grooming game and keep your bush tamed. Manscaped's new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good and turn the page on confidence this year. 
Whether you're going for a trim or that clean-shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, it is now your time to get a grip on your grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use the code TIMS, T-I-M-S, for 20% off and free shipping. The ball is dropped, but don't drop the ball on your balls. Introducing the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it's your grooming sidekick. It's just a ball sack trimmer to keep your scrotum safely shorn. Equ- <laughs> Equipped with two skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. And for my men who want the full grooming experience, look no further than Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0. In this grooming kit, you get the trusted lawnmower, Manscaped's ear and nose hair trimmer, and essential aftercare products with the Crop Soother Ball Aftershave Lotion and Crop Preserver Anti Chafing Ball Deodorant. Yep, it's deodorant for your balls. Bet you didn't know you needed that. Get 20% off and free shipping when you insert the code TIMS at manscaped.com. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer. Courtesy of Manscaped. So with that in mind, Simon Finnegan, where do you see Celtic in five years? Uh, there's a pub debate and it's got people split and whether or not Celtic can progress when we're so boring. But other people have argued it's not boring, it's professional. Where do you stand? I don't think on this instance Simon's referring to the football, Stephen. I think he's just talking about Celtic's overall approach to running mm. a football club. It, it being quite boring slash professional. I've said before that Celtic have got an addiction to continuity. Um, that they want to, they think they've been successful over the past ten years, and they have. But however this pans out, then you, it sort of changes the dynamic a little bit for me. Um, and they want to hold on to as much as that success as they can, and that that to them means just keep doing what you're doing. The, things happen the way they happen because we make them happen that way, and you pick up trophies along the way. Yeah, it's not boring. It's professional. Sounds a little bit like you're kind of desperately trying to not sound boring, doesn't it? It's not. It's, not, it's re- I know you're bored, but it's not boring, right? It's professional. Any excitingly run football clubs. I just. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if this is all just a myth now. Like, so the best club in the world or Man City obviously right at the moment uh, is there anything particularly exciting no they just go out and buy the most expensive footballers they can most but of that, the time is that not professional is that not how it should be they they create the environment for everything to be good whereas Celtic don't I, I also don't think, think that's right see with Man City that's quite a big example of that I don't think they mm-hmm. generally do go out and just sign the new hotness in football I think they generally get their recruitment right and obviously it's easier to do that no when you I have didn't mean that sorry resources. I meant the most expensive players they can. so if they uh, as you're obviously, if they want a right back they go out and find the best right back uh, for Man City and they go out and pay th- the money it takes to get that guy yeah. in the club they go and pay the money it's not but like it's never just random right backs though it's always mm. the guy that suits them best because Man United and Chelsea do the opposite they go out and just yeah. sign okay. who's available and pay and overpay for them Man City is generally the opposite they very rarely get signings wrong and it's because yes it's much much easier to do that when you have unlimited resources but they never get signed they never get players who look as if they just completely don't suit what they're trying to do so that, that Celtic suppose could be some sort of version of that but it's, again it's very 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 hard to do that when there's such an incredible infrastructure but is that in exci- place I suppose I, is that exciting is that, or is that prof- is that boring or is it professional yeah. for me the, you know? the professional is Man City and those type of teams that have a system have a manager and go out to get the player that suits that the exciting maybe ones are the ones like Man United like Chelsea the basket case clubs that don't really have a clue what they're doing. I'd love Celtic to be more professional and just go out and get the best player they can for the manager they can and see if they come out and said, look, we targeted guys, but we just can't push the boat out. But what we've got is this. But we don't have this. We've got this where we're constantly struggling for to see an identity with Celtic. And if you ask me where I think we'll be in five years, I think we'll be in the exact same position, to be honest. I think... If I look at the past five years, I we've won trebles, but we've also had a couple of really, really bad seasons. And this season could be that as well. So if we go look back and go, right, we've won trebles, we've won trophies. I I think we'll do that. I think we'll lose the odd league. And I think in Europe, we'll be pretty much the same. We'll be underperforming. Stephen, I think this five-year thing is quite interesting. Um, and it's quite interesting that Simon wants to look forward in five years. He says, where do you see Celtic in five years? Uh, incidentally, I don't think Celtic are very professional. And I'll get to that in a sec. But, you know, Celtic talk about decades of dominance and all that. And I don't know how many... Uh, that... that 
if Rangers were worst case scenario, Rangers win a treble this year, and I've I've ran through Rangers record previously on the podcast. But if if the five year record looks like Rangers have won a treble, made a European final, won a cup, and won a double, is that right? Won the league twice. If that's the five year record of Rangers, your rivals, so two leagues, one of which was a treble, uh, a double, and a European final. Go and I, but if you rewind the clock back ten years, we are better. You kind of go, well, we kind of don't care about ten years. Football's yeah. kind of lived in five year cycles or three year cycles. You know, even as soon as the season's done, it's done, and you want to win the next season, don't you? Yeah, so it's like you're you're talking about you know these ten year cycles. Why ten? It's because it suits you to talk about in ten year. <laughs> Why don't you do fifteen? Why don't you do twenty? It's it's what's what's happening. Uh, what has happened in the more recent past? I suppose I'm getting at what has happened in the last five years is more likely to be reflective of what's going to happen in the next five years as opposed to what happened in 2014. There's <laughs> almost no indication of what's going to happen <laughs> next season. So I, I think, where, where are Celtic going to be in the next five years? If nothing changes, uh, referring back to the last question, if there's no change to what I would call professional, I don't think running a club like a family business is professional. I don't no. think that mark. I don't think that is professionalism nowadays in football. I think doing more like what Man City do or what Manchester United with a new owner are trying to do, they are trying to professionalise things. They are trying to have best practice in all areas, which is probably another word for being super professional. But the way Celtic do it, relying on Drip Daddy Desmond's Rolodex and <laughs> ignoring the manager when he wants a certain type of player and bringing in people's sons who worked in golf shops and all that, that is, <laughs> that's, nor, that's neither boring nor professional. It's something else. It's professional again. It's like it's a sort of it's a thinly veiled other word for stable, and it? it's just like, I can you see Celtic going bust? No, you can't because they've got loads of money and they're very, very cautious, very, very conservative when it comes to spending the money. So professional does it? Does Those it? Those Tories sort on of, the board. <laughs> yeah, to, wow. does it sort of mean that I will, will, we look after the pennies and the pounds take after themselves? So that that's like, we're 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 in a stable position. Yeah, but I, th I think like there's there's a lot to be said for risk, risk and reward here. And where do I see Celtic in five years? I, th I think, I mean, I, th I broadly agree with what Melly's saying. I don't really see anything changing, but I think I have to believe that Celtic are going to be better in Europe and some sort of, I was going to say some sort of force, but I'd settle for not being a complete laughing stock in yeah. Europe, to be honest. Right. you know, it's, uh, And I have to believe that. I mean, it's, but it's not... Like, it's almost like a, this is going to sound really trite and pathetic enough. One of these podcasts, but it's like I'm not not really that concerned with like a destination in five years' time. I just want to feel along the way like we're heading somewhere. It's yeah. about the journey and all that all that shit. But I kind of mean that making friends just, along the way. <laughs> yeah, all, all that sort of <laughs> stuff. I want to believe that we're we are all focusing towards some sort of common goal. And if that is maybe getting to a European final or something like that, then great. The minute we stop believing that and we we start to think that Celtic have completely chucked it, that's when people get angry and it's for a good reason. And that's why I never get on board with this sort of entitled pattern, you know, mm -hmm. people who, who get you know, trebles shut up, thrown in their face. Uh, that's all good, but it's in the past now. We want to be looking forward and seeing what we can do. There's no sense, there's no sense in being completely obsessed by the past and never really doing anything towards the future. Something you just said there about... I taken it as ten years instead of five. That that's the real quiz. Like, it's it's yeah. more of a ten year thing. It reminded me of something I heard recently about how it was another football so the the a podcast rather the football ramble got a question about what actually defines big clubs and all that. And they had to quite. A, they, they all agreed it was a kind of pointless debate anyway. But they they spoke about various criteria, and they said that things like Chelsea are always been told like they've got no history. Hell of a present though, isn't it? Like, I know not yeah. right today, but in the last ten years they've won, they've won like Champions well, Leagues and Europa Leagues. You Just because that. they didn't win anything in the seventies doesn't mean that they don't count as a club. It's it's okay to have a present and a future as well as stuff from decades so, ago. So it's it's I know my football memory is pretty dodgy at times, but it's it's you bringing up Chelsea was sort of in my mind when I was talking about that because the Chelsea era kind of ended as the Man City era started. Yeah, didn't it? That's kind of how it went down down south, sort of. It's almost like you're. It's not as dramatic as this, but it's also like it's almost like Chelsea being three years into the Man City era, going, oh, "It's been a bad three years, but check out the last ten. Like, <laughs> yeah. it kind of doesn't, it kind of doesn't count yeah. for an awful lot. So, no, I, I think the last five years is more of an indicator of how Celtic are going to be going forward. But they do, they, they're not boring, they're 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 unprofessional, and uh, they really need to sort of 
it just doesn't feel like a modern function of football club. And I think I'm quite surprised Brendan Rogers signed up to that. So it'll be interested to see what happens going forward. Okay, we have yeah, a... Bored will be th- delighted with that one. They were not boring and were unprofessional. Yeah, Pat's got, in the back all round. We've got three questions to go. Oh. We're not boring and unprofessional. Well, uh, nah, uh, okay. I was talking about us there. <laughs> uh, why do you think Michael Mikey Johnson is doing so well in the championship? And what do you think of the calls from it get another choice chance at Celtic? Martin Melly, this uh, could be answered very, very quickly. Let's hear it. <laughs> Yeah, I just just found somewhere else to play his football. It wasn't working for him at Celtic. It hasn't done for a a long, long time. He was a sort of symbol of everything wrong with Celtic this season and the fact that he was so far out the picture last season he wasn't even there and now he's coming on contributing, trying to win Celtic games and but he's no, I don't care if he goes and scores 10 goals between now and the end of the season. If he comes back to Celtic next season and has two bad games, what's the point? We know what we're going to get with Mikey Johnson. Sometimes it just doesn't work out at places for him. He might have started off well, but I think it's gone for him at Celtic. And for his own sake, just go and enjoy your football, mate. I think if he can go down there and play football, that's fine. But to make it at Celtic, you need more than that. And all you need to do is go and watch the last five minutes of that Celtic Rangers game and watch Mikey Johnson's performance. He was abysmal, and if Celtic had a drawn to each in that game, it probably would have been down to him because he simply wasn't marking or trying to get back against Rangers' best player. So it's done for him at Celtic. Good luck to him down there. Hopefully we get a decent fee for him, but I, I wouldn't have him back. One of the best players in the championship right now, Mikey Johnson, Stephen. It's interesting because Brendan Rodgers spoke midweek saying something along the lines of sometimes the Celtic jersey is just too heavy for players. And the Mikey Johnson thing... I, you, you never want to be too harsh on him because he's obviously a talented footballer there's something mm-hmm. in there but no manager has relied on Mikey Johnson and in fact the the patter from all the recent Celtic managers that have worked with the guy seems to be Mikey's got the talent he needs to oh. apply himself at Celtic that's that's the recurring theme about Mikey Johnson and whether people want to admit it or not whether West Brom fans want to admit it or even Celtic fans I think want to admit it the standards that Celtic have are sky high I'm sure they are sky high at training and Brendan Rodgers himself is probably a very very exacting manager Ange Postacoglu very very exacting manager Neil Lennon no idea people assume the guy isn't but that remains to be seen because he's another one who didn't like Mikey Johnson's application so obviously even if if the standard for Mike for being a Neil Lennon Celtic team is down here even Mikey Johnson couldn't breach that that yeah. so there's there's a there's high standards of being at Celtic because of the club and culture we're trying to create and I don't think I don't think that's the same standard that West Brom I just don't and I think West Brom they're a good club but the, it's Mikey Johnson's a sort of barometer he's went down there and he's playing every week he's certainly not I don't imagine he's training any harder I don't imagine no. he's become suddenly a better footballer than all of a sudden that he's stuck on a West Brom shirt but he's just found his level. The level to be in West Brom, starting a living and playing that team is a wee bit lower and he's getting more opportunities now. Well, see, in fairness, he was playing a lot for Celtic before he went to West Brom. It wasn't the fact he wasn't being given a chance. He was getting plenty of chances this season and not taking them. He played loads. He was starting games before he left for West Brom. That was another mad thing that Celtic did. So in recent weeks and months, we've taken players who were playing such as David Turnbull, Mikey Johnson, Leo Labada and Burnaby. They're all gone now. They were playing <laughs> football and now they're gone in between January and March. It was incredible. But I, I I think people are losing their minds with this Mikey Johnson stuff, I have to say. I think it's a have we lost our minds though. But you mm. see these goals for West Brom, those will go away and everyone right. will forget about it eventually. There's nothing some Celtic fans love more online than players who are not playing for Celtic who have failed for Celtic and they're doing it elsewhere or see he should have been given a chance he said seven or eight years at it and it just hasn't worked out for him as far as this the jersey's too heavy for him stuff goes don't think I really buy that either because Mikey Johnson well, what do you is, think it means what do you think well, that analogy means well I think that the, the players find that the, the pressure's too much at Celtic right uh, that I uh, I'm not dismissing that entirely, but in Mikey Johnson's case, he is not a player who ever struck me as lacking in confidence. Never, ever. I think he looks like a very confident player and, and believes in himself an awful lot. And he, to to the very end, Mikey Johnson was trying things at Celtic and it wasn't coming off for him. He was dribbling, he was trying to set up goals. It just wasn't happening for him at all. 
So I don't really buy that. I know that all the pressure's off at Celtic. He's suddenly a, a much better or a better player now that the the jersey is off. Because what about what about the other way around? What about players who come to Celtic and look better? Is it because they threw off that Scunthorpe shirt that was too heavy for him and Gary Hooper scoring thirty goals a season up here? Do you know? Well, <laughs> so it, mm. it's quite it's quite selective. Like what if what about players six who, goals and seven starts? Aye, but it will go away. <laughs> it, it, it will it will stop for Mikey Johnson and we won't forget about it. Like, Scott Sinclair came up here and started scoring countless goals. I mean, again, there are players who come to Scotland and are better once they have that massively heavy jersey put on them rather than these so-called clubs that have lower standards than Celtic do. So I don't think I buy it in this case. I think Maggie Johnson was always a confident player. It just didn't work out for him. And it happens all the time. It happens to very, very good players who, who are at clubs that just doesn't, that for whatever we reason, it just doesn't suit the them. Youths. There wouldn't even be this conversation. See, no. we signed Mikey Johnson for Motherwell. Look, no one even mentions David Turnbull anymore. No, not He's not, not had a mention since he left for no. Cardiff. Not once no. since he left, and it's because he never came through the youths. And we like the romantic mm. idea of a guy coming through the youths and, and playing well and all that sort of stuff because he's living out our dreams. But it's 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 just a burden no. because, like Melly says, he's Mikey Johnson's had plenty of opportunities at Celtic. And, and to be honest, sometimes I get pissed off watching him ping goals in for West Brom. Because we've needed them this season. We've yeah. needed, we've been toiling. And if you've got that in the locker, where's it been? And don't say you've not had a chance because as you point out, Stephen, he did. So, Plenty. He's played uh, loads this season and people forget that. I, I, once he goes to West Brom and starts scoring goals, it quickly becomes about how he was never given a chance here. And like, people saying, aye, but that was seasons ago. Like, he needs a run of games now. He played plenty this season. He was played time and again because... people think it is. No, and fans were getting frustrated with it. Why is Mikey Johnson playing? There was one game in particular where he was absolutely dreadful. And we got onto a podcast afterwards and said that's got to be it for him. But Brendan Rodgers kept at it. He kept at it. Kept playing, playing Mikey Johnson, hoping to fashion some sort of effective winger out of him. It just didn't happen. And I think so sometimes, the, sometimes it really do be like that for players. I don't think it worked out for him. For Mikey Johnson so far this season, twelve games for Celtic, two goals, one assist, six point eight foot more rating. West Brom, 10 Is that just league games as well, though? The, the 12? No, 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 no. The 12 includes Scottish Cup and cha two Champions no. League appearances. Uh, West Brom, 10 with six goals and one assist for <laughs> West Brom. So, you know, if, if he wants to stay at West Brom, he seems to be performing quite well there. Okay, here we go. Next up, Stephen Smith. How interested are you three in Scotland's international exploits? Because it is International Week. If you are at at all, how much does that hinge on players being current or ex-players or even Celtic adjacent? Mm. Um, I am a fair weather Scotland fan. Tournament uh, tart. Same. Tournament tart, <laughs> I must admit. Um, and I think, to be honest, if the Scotland team went to the Euros with no Celtic players in it or Kieran Tierney, I would... Mm, they'd probably take John McGinn. So I think there needs to be, yeah, there needs to be a Celtic element, I think, for me. I'm trying to think, if we went to the Euros with no Celtic representation, which is obviously quite difficult and quite strange, but maybe not too far in the future that will be the case. With no Celtic representation, I think I would struggle to connect with the Scotland team in any meaningful way, Melly. Nah, I, I, like, I love Scotland. I think it's, for me, it's always build myself up to before the qualification for tournament and then get let down in it and go, ah, oh, I can't be bothered with the rest of the campaign. But I've always been quite passionate about Scotland. It gives me an opportunity to watch football with my other mates, so to speak. So I think for me, I love being They're Scottish. Not your friends. We are your friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love being Scottish and I've also got great affinity for Ireland because that's where my family are from. But I've always wanted... Scotland to do well rather than Ireland qualify for tournaments so I'll, I'll always look out for Scotland I'll always watch the games when I can and even if there wasn't a big Celtic contingency in it I'd still stick with it I think I've never been to a Scotland game you know that never have you not never long time for me anyway I can't because mostly because they play at Hamden <laughs> 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 unfortunately yeah. Stephen uh, I'm much the same I, I do I do like Scotland I do follow Scotland when it comes to the international breaks because I've got nothing else on absolutely mm -hmm. nothing else on when it comes to Celtic and podcasts and all that but I will never and I will never ever what sorry you like your rollerblading yeah <laughs> we're not playing <laughs> It's not getting in the way. There's just no way. I'm not letting Scotland get in the way of my, my rollerblading passion. 
rollerblading family football in that order. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, yeah, I, I like Scotland. I, I do, I, and I do follow follow them, but I, I don't go to the games, and I, I'm not particularly. In, there's no way I'm ever going to be as invested in it as I am um, club football and Celtic. I just, I'm just not. It just doesn't hold the same the same fire for me at all. I treat it as a a nice little sort of side show. It's something I enjoy rather than something I'm fully bought into. I, I don't mind sitting down and watching Scotland games. I, I really enjoy it at, at a tournament. Yeah. You know, it's something we've not had very often. I still remember me and a couple of pals going round to one of their houses and watching them play Brazil at France in 98. Yeah. Back in those, I mean, so, so long ago now. Uh, but I, remember, I still remember that. And to not have that throughout the basically entire adult life up until a couple of years ago, Probably did get in the way, probably did puncture things a little bit when it comes to, to me in Scotland. So hopefully there were a new generation coming through who are used to Scotland actually being a feature at, at these events going forward because it'll, it'll definitely be good for the, the state of the game going forward. But my my investment is, as a, same similar to you, fairly fair weather, to be honest. But I, I, I'm definitely a Scotland fan, just not a, just not a fanatic. Emma Kathleen. Weird pronunciation on the Kathleen there, wasn't it? Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Melly mentioned on this week's flagship, or last week's flagship as it will be, uh, that Dyla was his lowest ranked manager for Celtic in his lifetime. Who would have been the in-between options? Uh, who's everyone else's lowest ranked manager and highest ranked? So a question for us, not just Melly. So um, lowest ranked and highest ranked and one in-between Melly. So Dyla's your lowest. Who, is, who gets the highest ranking Celtic manager for you? Uh, just behind is Ange but Martin O'Neill man the guy changed everything for me as a Celtic fan there were points where I didn't know if Celtic would ever win the league again and Can, just before you go down a wee this wee trip down memory lane and I'm sure we're all going to love it and enjoy it uh, <laughs> I, I must remind you of your own criteria uh, <laughs> and your own criteria for ranking Ronnie Dyla as the lowest ranked manager if I remember the flagship correctly was in terms of his career to date being the lowest ranked manager so right. the guy sort of least worthy of the Celtic job I think was kind of how you were Aye. you were ranking them there so, I think you said uh, low, lowest ranked as in as in sort of if you were to divide available managers into tiers Ronnie yes. Dyla probably sits in the bottom one rather than in your top 10 managers that, that have ever managed Celtic so so uh, it's, it's about their career to this point but again mm. Martin O'Neill probably could Aye. It's, it's a toss up between him and Brendan I suppose or Aye. Probably Brendan would be top, Martin O'Neill, but is Ange maybe a, just above well, Ronnie then? No, I, well, no, because is Ange not above Brendan? Do we just not value, are we, are we by putting Brendan above Ange not just as guilty of, or even the debate, not even having the debate, are we not just as guilty of the snobbery that we accused other people of? Because Ange has won. What what what's Ange won before he came to Celtic? Uh, Much title, than, title, Japanese title, yeah. Japanese won, title, Asia Cup, Japanese title, Australian title, and international Australia, honours the, with yeah, Australia. International honours with Australia. So, a but very to not high, have any European experience or any sort of mm. European trophy in there. Uh, so is, what had Brendan? What had Brendan done before he came to Celtic? Remind me. He nearly won the league with Liverpool, hadn't he? No. He's nearly winning league is not a trophy. That's, so. what, that's that meme <laughs> in it, the trophy. <laughs> the yeah. what did yeah, they, but, so what's he so what they're all lined up, they're standing and beside just to the right is a wee but it's not a pontoon where a wee thing with their trophies piled up on it and next to what's Brendan got next to him? Eh, well, he's got a style of football, hasn't he? And I, I know he's not got the trophies, but at the time he was a big manager who I remember where we were doing podcasts at the time and Brendan Rodgers was mentioned and you just said, Jamie, something like, it's never going to happen. And that was it. We just moved on. We didn't disagree with you. Said some thought... this time around as well, right enough, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> For very I, different reasons. I don't know. I think Martin, Martin O'Neill would be top because he came from Leicester. He'd won cups there and all that. But out with the rest is maybe Vim down at the bottom as well. He had a good playing career, but his management career wasn't great up till then. So, so Stephen, here we go. Brendan Rodgers honours prior to joining Celtic, right? This is the Wikipedia entry. Football League Championship Playoff 2011 with Swansea. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. That was big. Manager of the Year 2013-14. Uh, the end. 
That, that's, that's, <laughs> that's basically scrolling what, and scrolling and scrolling. That's, right. that's basically what uh, what Brendan Fraud. Com- company yeah. Celtic. Um, Martin O'Neill had won an FA Cup. Um, a league cup, cup, a, a league cup was it? League Cup. Mm. I'll pull up his record as well. But Stephen, this this Gordon Strachan had just been relegated with Coventry, hadn't he? No. He's talking about Gordon Strachan. <laughs> Tony, Tony Mowbray. We'll I'll throw he, him in there as well. Another, down, Tony uh, Mowbray another relegation. Down, eh? mm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've kind of lost sight of what, what it is we're actually trying to do in terms of these ranking systems. So I'm just going to come out and say I absolutely fucking love Ange Postecoglou. Don't care what MD <laughs> says. Don't care about trophies. Don't care about anything. Rankings. Right? I'm an unapologetic. And a, a, a stange. <laughs> a stange. <laughs> a stange. <laughs> I am a stange for Ange Postecoglou. Absolutely love the guy. He, at my age, right, it's very difficult to top things that happened when you were like 13, 14. Right? You tend to like all your favourite bands and all your favourite films and all that are from around that time. You, you kind of you, you fill yourself with nostalgia about how everything was better back then. So to get to this age and have someone fully buy you into just everything that was going on and just w- what a ride it was it's it's kind of remarkable really because back then when i started going to football w- with my pals you know it was tommy burns which was obviously brilliant that, that was tremendous as well and i would put him right up there in terms of like my my celtic managers even though he only won a scottish cup but and and just right up there, I absolutely love that. And supposed to go and I, I don't I don't care that he left. I mean I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold that against him forever. But uh, Martin O'Neill certainly up there. My lowest ranked. I mean I'm I'm old enough to just. They went in second time round, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it's John. It's John, it's, uh, it's John Barnes. John Barnes. Uh, oh, well, uh, that was my first about. season ticket. That was my first ever season ticket. So I do have fond memories of of that particular season. Prior to that, I was just picking up tickets here and there. You've made, I'm you've, old enough you've to both made a mockery of this ranking system. Honestly, don't, I don't understand <laughs> it. I don't understand it at all. But, but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Melly says Neil Lennon second time around was least worthy of this the Celtic job. But oh, second right, time right, around, that's the guy who'd job. already won stuff. So. Ah, right. Aye, but it's, there's context in there as well, but isn't there? Aye, Aye, right. If we're, if we're doing that, if we're, if we're not ranking our favourite managers, like, no, most, that's most precisely worth, what we're not doing. Yeah, most worthy of getting the Celtic job, then it, I don't know, it probably is Martin O'Neill. Probably Martin O'Neill. He's managed at a very good level as well. I mean, it, someone coming from the Premier League to manage in a Premiership, as it probably would have been then, to manage in Scotland is a big deal. That doesn't happen that often now, unless you're kind of either been, you've either been sacked or relegated, or you're just an up and coming kind of unproven guy. Mm-hmm. Like Steven Gerrard had come from someone's reserves to to come and manage Rangers. So it's hard to talk, Martin O'Neill. Did you, you see never... he was the up and coming guy? Did you, Stephen Gerrard? Stephen Gerrard, yeah. <laughs> <I'm> out, <laughs> hand out for him. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's hard to talk, Martin O'Neill, because. I know, I know if, if Brendan Rodgers, to circle all the way back to the first question again, unfortunately, if he was to be sacked at the end of the season, yeah, not going to happen. But if he was, the same conversations would happen. You you need someone who's experienced. You need someone who's won things in other other leagues and all that. It's actually very difficult. When you look at the list of people of them, who have yeah. managed here, it's, it's kind of none of them. So we're, we're kind of looking for that that unicorn of managers that probably doesn't exist. So all that, all that considered, it's probably Martin O'Neill who's been the most qualified coming in. Final question. Good old fashioned, who's better? Oh, mm. hey. <laughs> Paul Devaney. Greg Taylor is a better fullback than Alistair Johnson. Discuss and decide. Oh, let me pop that question up just a fraction longer for people that want to have a wee look at Alistair Johnson and his teenage mutant ninja turtle face. Yeah, his nipple. <laughs> <laughs> right, Melly. Pick. Uh, potentially, but I just prefer Alistair Johnson. I don't know. That's just my personal preference. I think. Mm. He's more solid, but Greg Taylor's maybe a better footballer, but I do I expect more assists from Alistair Johnson? Probably. So I don't know if it's just Greg Taylor suffers from the fact that he came from Kilmarnock. He's maybe Scottish and he's not not a guy we've bought in for money from a foreign league. But for me, a preference... Uh, would I go Alistair? No, I'll go with Greg Taylor. Greg, Greg Taylor for me. I, uh, I'm a big Greg Taylor fan, Stephen. Yeah. I think I think Greg Taylor's really come on to our game recently. I think he's long overdue a new Celtic contract. I can't believe there's discussions about Liam Scales getting a contract and there's no discussion whatsoever about Greg Taylor getting a contract. I think we need to see that signed. Uh, I like Alistair Johnson. I am beginning to wonder, you know, he's a good player. And to be honest, between the pair of them, I don't think there's much in it. Um, no. But to damn with faint praise, Greg Taylor, with the way I'm about to describe Alistair Johnson... 
I think he's Alistair Johnson is the level of Celtic player you expect. I don't think he's too good for us. I don't think he's a player that we're going to struggle or we should struggle to keep a hold of. I think Alistair Johnson is right slap bang, your seven out of ten, eight out of ten Celtic player. He's not the best player in the squad. He's not the worst, but they they shouldn't really come any worse than Alistair Johnson for me as as the standard for a Celtic player. No, you would certainly hope not. No, that, yeah. I think it's a decent way of looking at it. I think Alistair Johnson, in terms of the various That's perceptions, he's an excellent player. By the way, I don't. I'm not saying he's rubbish and he yeah. barely makes the grade. He's a he's a good footballer. Oh, um, he definitely is. Uh-huh. He's coming. He's been up and down this season, but I think he's he's kind of hit his straps in in recent weeks. Just as a, a few people are, stay, are stepping up towards the end of the season, I think Alistair Johnson probably comes into that as well. He's been much better. Very unlucky with that. Yeah, another offside goal against mm-hmm. St. Johnson. He scored an absolute cracker, but was let down by some of these some of these kneecap or something like that in the build up to it. James Forrest, I think it was the fraud that he is. <laughs> yeah, so much for playing well. He left his toe, toenail it's offside. Best winger day that. <laughs> 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 See when we say that as well, a toenail offside. What a deeply unpleasant image that is. <laughs> that 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 sort of comes with an image of a big massive toenail sticking through your boot and being well, offside. Well, Absolutely you seen vile. They're changing the offside rule. They're giving trials to a new one yep. where yeah. the player's full body has to be offside, and people right. are saying, "Well, this is a great change," but to me. It's, you're still looking for fractionals. We can discuss it in another podcast when, Aye, when so that idea comes Is out. enough of his hip just offside? Or, yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be it, the same you're still thing. Discuss- it? it's not, you're just discussion. You're just looking for fractionals at the the, the, the back end of the player who's attacking, <laughs> yeah. not the front end this time kind of thing. Yes. So I, anyway, yeah. Stephen. I think we just need to make... I, I'm not, I'm not going to drag us into this because I'm desperately desperate not to talk about VAR and replays and all that, but no. it, it, there has to be somewhere in the middle where it, if it's obviously offside and someone has obviously gained a very obvious advantage from being obviously offside, then fine. But if we are drawing lines and there's like a shoulder or whatever, then I think it's it's going against the game rather than for it, right? So where were we? Alistair Johnson and Greg Taylor. I think Greg Taylor does suffer from, a little bit from a... A sort of PR perspective, uh, a, a branding um, perspective, mm. because he is always the first guy to get it, and I don't really know why that is. There's probably a number of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, he, he can't do anything about that. But even, and again, I, I know I said in a, a separate point earlier that it's, it's, you can't really gauge fan opinion. So I'm only humorously taking stuff from like, comments we receive. But it's quite funny seeing that whenever we slag off Liam Scales or talk about how we wouldn't give him a new contract, well, obviously, you give Liam Scales a contract. He's the starting player right now. He starts every game, so obviously gets a new contract. Meanwhile, get that Greg Taylor out. He's absolute pish. And he never deserved to be here in the first place. It's, it's <laughs> I mean, absolutely no bizarre. Shot like back, isn't <laughs> so I, I like Greg Taylor. I think he's been a very good player. Is he, is he like, amazing? Is he... Is he the type of player where you simply can't live without? No, I don't. I don't think so. But I'd be as much as I'm careful to say things like this because it does. You do risk sort of stagnating, but I think Greg Taylor might be an example of kind of careful what you wish for when it comes yes, to trying exactly to improve upon to him. Can we improve on Greg Taylor? Almost certainly. Will we imp- improve on Greg Taylor or will we end up in our bowling goalie, lacks oh, out oh, one of these oh, guys, Burnaby? Can we improve on yeah. him, Stephen? Probably. Have we repeatedly tried for years and yes. years and years and Five years? Five years or whatever it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yes, and failed. Yeah. Uh, and on just that, before we oh, finish up, I was just going to fling you a wee question there. No, we don't. On, this, on that <laughs> note. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> on that note, who, do you, who would you prefer? Uh, AJ or JJ? Uh, I think Juranovic is a better player. I don't Aye. think there's much debate yeah. about that. I think Juranovic is honest. a better player and we should have kept him. I don't know why we were in such a rush to sell the guy who didn't want to leave. Yeah, well, it's, it's, he was linked away with, for quite a long time and I think oh, it, it was a good it was a good move for, for Juranovic as well. One that probably wouldn't have come up again. He got to go and play in the Bundesliga, at the top end of the Bundesliga for, for a wee while and the Champions League. So I, I, don't, I don't think it was a, a terrible move all round. But I think like, Celtic... I'd like to keep Juranovic but he had these problems as well I don't want to kind of whitewash his past he had he had a few kind of shockers in, in his time as well remember that, that time at left back oh. that left back again so it's not do his you, fault do you know what I, I, heard, I heard an interesting story that I might tell on a Patreon podcast because I don't <laughs> want to divulge too much I, I heard an interesting story um, from someone who would know about how I know I'm being a bit of a wank on this but I, de- I genuinely don't want to expose someone here that about how that 
performance came about in the week leading up to that and uh, yeah, all the sort of politics around that game it saw Juranovic end up at left back and needless to say it was quite an odd thing to hear so maybe maybe I'll expo- I'll, you know what I'll do I'll tell it in the discord as a rival right, okay. here, so I'll, I'll tell it in the discord um, but Stephen yeah have you got any final thoughts on Juranovic? Yeah, I thought a good player. I, I don't think there's there's a huge amount in it. I, I don't think. I think Johnson's peaks have been very high as well. I don't. Maybe Juranovic slightly more consistent. Maybe. I was going to say Juranovic maybe better going forward, but I don't know if that's necessarily the truth either. Yeah, I think, I think Juranovic, he's a crosser. Maybe, he's yeah. I, but that's that's possible. Juranovic could maybe take a penalty, although he did miss one or two as well. So I, I thought generally, I don't think there's that much in it. I think we've maybe done that thing where Juranovic played at a World Cup and all that and went on to play in the Champions League. So we just sort of we embellished his career with Celtic a little bit. I think he was good though. I definitely think he was good. But I think Alistair Johnson has been similarly good, if if maybe not quite as good. But I don't. I, I really don't think there's that much in it. I know I'm, it sounds like I'm sitting on the fence there a little bit, but I I, I don't think there's much between the two. Listen, support us on Patreon. Amongst many, many other fantastic benefits, you get ad-free flagship podcasts on there as well. You get match reactions and at-the-match podcasts to every single Celtic game. And you get that for less than the price of a match day programme per month. And you can support us and you can help us invest in the podcast. And that is really what drives the podcast on, this continued support of our patrons. So thanks to the guys that submitted questions. We'll be back with the flagship podcast. See you next week. <laughs>